business is the adoption of the agenda. We have a late item here um, in a presentation by our sun, summer intern students. We'll put that under late item. Okay. Motion. Council of Jordy. All those in favor. Uh, and the first delegation this evening is the uh, Trail Society uh, requesting council to consider matching funds to a new picture. <coughs> and you're on. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Good morning. My name is George Longdon, as uh, many of you know. I'm standing in for Chris Meisel, who was uh, called away for a family uh, situation. So I'm the, uh, the last minute addition, I'd say. Um, It worked, I don't believe it. This is the trail behind Roxel. Um, I'd like to note the fact that um, the city has done a great job of kept keeping it cut, but the three meter wide trail that was done in 2003 with gravel crush uh, doesn't hardly exist anymore in this stretch of the, of the trail. I'd like to think of this more as a sidewalk rather than a trail. And that's because of the number of users. This is a, is a great um, connection for the people who live in the nursery area to the downtown area. And I have to show you the camera that we uh, used. We use this to try and ascertain who our users are. And so this has been up for about two weeks. And uh, what we did was we counted all the people who used the trail. Yeah, <laughs> Fortunately, do you recognize yourself? <laughs> Fortunately, we don't see any ATVs. Okay, thank you. We don't see any ATVs. Uh, there are no dirt bikes to be seen. Over a two week period, we had three horses, 16 deer that triggered the, the camera. But there were 116 pedestrians and 257 cyclists. Wow. Two weeks. So, so it seems to me that this piece of uh, sidewalk, and I'm using the word sidewalk, is well used. So that works out to about 18 cyclists a day and eight pedestrians. So uh, here's the, what I think are the advantages of this project. First of all, it improves the connectivity in and around the city. It connects that area of the nursery and all the people who live south of the nursery um, with the downtown core very, very readily. I was talking to um, somebody yesterday at the car show who had ridden from <coughs> south of Gilpin into town and uh, quite enjoying the, uh, the, the route because the city maintained it. It facilitates and encourages green transportation. Uh, it goes without saying with the number of cyclists that this is definitely green. It encourages a wider range of citizens to be active. Uh, I sat through uh, 500 images that came through on this on this camera for um, a two-week period, and there was a wide range of users from young people to people my age. And so I sort of focused on the older people because, um, as someone who was drawn here as a tourist, I remember stopping at the uh, early parking lot in, in uh, 1998 
and we brought our way actually through east from, from here and uh, we stopped and we ended up going to a real estate agent that very day in that afternoon and this is the most important thing is it supports the the city's integrated community sustainability plan so i did a little nostalgia trip this is uh this is looking back looking west um in 2007, uh, which at that time was a campfire property. And if you look at it today, uh, Roxel has spent an awful lot of money. They just did that curbing around the outside of the parking lot last week. They spent about, I, I, I actually went to Comcast in Kelowna to find out how much that cost. They spent about $8,000 on there. So if you look at their investment in, in the trail in this community, it's probably close to $35,000. This is looking uh, east from the, from the parking lot. It's all been nicely graded. Uh, it's all ready for the next step. So you should have a handout in your, um, in your package that um, basically follows the same design. What I've done here is I've divided it up into two pieces. And the only thing I've added is the parking lot curbing under under the cost side. And as you can see, I put that down as about $8,000. So this project is now becoming about a $307,000 project. So, I guess the good news is that we have funding from a variety of sources. The Trans Canada Trail Foundation has already put up $56,000. The Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, who own about 0.6 of a kilometer of the trail on, on part one of this project, um, they're putting up $100,000. And uh, as you can see, we're putting down Roxel for about $32,000 for their investment. So right now, we're about $68,000 short. That's the, that's the round number. Strangely enough, this is the 68th Avenue Bridge to Nursery Trust portion of this. I don't know where that ties to you. Yes, sir. Uh, 68,000, that's what you need to finish it. That's what we need to finish it. And these are the numbers that we have from urban systems. Um, this uh, is an engineer's numbers. These are not our the original numbers we came up with. I, I will admit that I was uh, quite naive in terms of what the cost would be. And so having urban systems numbers, we're, we're at about $239,000 in terms of the amount of money we need. We need three hundred and seven. So that's about $68,000. So this is the parking lot, uh, once again. Um, as I say, this was done last week by Roxel. I'm sorry? One more question. Uh, is the parking lot going to be paid? Uh, my understanding is that the material that they put down is crushed rock, not, okay. not sand or or lightweight material. So it will pack. But my understanding is it's not going to be paved. Okay. I mean, they have spent all that money paving their new roadway, uh, but I don't think there's a plan to pave. Okay, no problem. Thank you. So. The questions we asked at the last gathering here uh, a month ago was the city can the city supply gravels and fresh? And I think your staff has answered that question. Can the city allocate more dollars? That's the big question. Can the city match the additional or Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations dollars? Another big question. I'm hoping they don't provide an answer for that today. Uh, we yes, sir. is the uh, uh, MFL uh, dollars contingent on matching funds? Uh, my understanding is that it's a straight straight ahead uh, amount to be to be to be allocated for this project. Right. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily contingent. Do you have an answer for that uh, through to uh, your CAO? Mr. Mayor, I haven't heard from the uh, from the uh, manager responsible for the ministry yet, but I understand that they are. My understanding was they were going to be matching the funds if we matched the funds. That was what I heard. That was the last thing I heard, but I hadn't had any conversation, so this is all through Chris Muslin. 
Yes. Um, yes. And uh, as I once again, as I'm standing in for him, I did not make the, the connection with uh, the manager, with John Hawkins. It was Chris. Similar to the administrative, the what, what is the, the matching uh, funds? Well, the, the we're looking for sixty-eight thousand dollars. Yeah, sixty-eight thousand. That's, that's what I have. Plus, that's it. We've already allocated fifty in this year's annual budget. You're looking for another sixty. We're looking for another sixty-eight. In actual fact, uh, we were looking through our financial plan. We allocated some work to be done to the site pile this year, but it turned out that we don't have to do the work. So we have the money allocated in the budget. We just take a resolution of council to say that they would like to take the money they've already allocated in the financial plan and reallocate it to this portion. So it wouldn't require uh, taking the extra funds out from reserves. It would just be reallocating the funds that are already approved. Okay, so we have no money there. Councilor Kendall. Yes, but then you know, slang, the money that we had budgeted yeah. we're, we're on the slang by left, we still have the slang reserve fund for that. So it wasn't really allocated for other projects. It was basically a, a one time thing if we had to, to deal with the slang fund. Yes, the uh, the trails money was coming from the slang reserve as well. So yeah. we all coming from the yeah. 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 Sorry, go ahead. The wild card in this is um, we're still in negotiation with the area D of the regional district. I mean, you know, when you think about the fact that uh, area D, in terms of the nursery, is going to be a major benefactor of this new sidewalk that we're talking about here, phase one of this project, uh, it seems appropriate to uh, to be looking to uh, very hard regional district area D for, for some gas tax money on it. And we had met with uh, the representative last year, and uh, she had made a commitment of funds at that time. Um, so we're hoping that that still is in place. So, and, Councillor Smith. So you haven't had that conversation then, or Chris hasn't? We have been trying to have that conversation for about a month now. Okay. Another question too is uh, so. So if we put in 68, the government or the ministry will put in 68. Is that is that what's going on? Or if we put in 34, they'll put in 34 to make up that 68. No, no, I think you're missing what we're matching here. It's the Ministry of uh, Forestry Lands uh, money, a hundred thousand yeah. dollar commitment that we were really talking okay. about matching. The city. Okay. The, here's here's what the, this exists exists at the moment. The city had allocated fifty thousand dollars for this, mm -hmm. and originally the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resources Operations had allocated fifty thousand dollars. But last Wednesday, John Hawkins called Chris, and this is this is once again secondhand information, and said that they had found another fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so that's hundred thousand. Okay. So that's what makes up the hundred thousand dollars. But at this point, we don't know whether that extra fifty thousand dollars has any strings, with our strings attached. I mean, <laughs> you know, they found an extra fifty. <laughs> your yes, your, I, 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 yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I I'm going to say that uh, John would have made the commitment without having the money. Right. Yeah. But, um, as I wasn't part of the conversation. I can't give you the exact details. That's where we're at right now. Anyone from the gallery have any questions? I don't see any hands popping up, so uh, council, you're still on. Yeah, so uh, I think the CIPP grant, there's, there's a number of places where a grant could go uh, in the future. Uh, that seems to be a concern, but uh, one of the things that's come up on, on a number of, uh, of people who responded to our from Twitter or from fa our Facebook page is the trail that runs uh, from the old uh, the, uh, along Cold Shoot Road back to uh, just south of town here, the or should say north of town. There was originally a rail line that ran into. The, Pardon? Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Yes, that, that's the base of observation amount. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so that's a place where it could be could be happening. Certainly, you know, the, the Riverside Trail that runs uh, north from the bridge. There's a there's a number of opportunities. My personal pet, and uh, I just may may be a little more than the CIPP grant to pay for. We have a wetland that is immediately south of the. Uh, 
Oh, but the, uh, the cemetery. The cemetery. And you you can't you know, unless you go there, you can't believe the number of birds that are are there. It's it's just it's amazing. And to run a trail from you know, along the the, uh, the south side of the cemetery to the dog park, uh, it would have to be fenced. But to me, there's a, there's room for a CIPP grant there. And that stands for Community Infrastructure Partnership Program. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so. A big thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to be here again this morning, and um, we're looking forward to a decision. Yeah. Do you have any questions? I'm sure we do. Councillor Smith, then Kendall, then uh, Odor. So what will the ask be for the uh, area B? Um, the original um, allocation that was offered was $100,000, but we don't have that in writing. So we, before we go any further, we need to have a conversation with um, the director and the ultimate director and uh, to have this cleared up before we go any further. All right. Well, I We're guess trying to have that conversation. Yeah. Well, that, I, I guess that's where I'm kind of questioning. If we put in the 68, then the need for uh, our area piece contribution is going to be a significant, right? Well, when I, I'm allocate, just wondering if, if that conversation should happen first before the, uh, the city is we expect to, to, to cough up that 68. Okay. Okay. Uh, just to clarify one thing, the alternate has all of the powers of the director at this point in time, and there's no need or really it's bad protocol at this point to be consulting with the director that's off hill. I, I know the complications here. But just to let you know, that was yep. an issue that came up at our board table at the regional level. That the power invested in the alternate is uh, altogether the same. Yes. And Councillor Campbell, um, a couple of things from the pictures and the usage. It isn't that the trail is not accessible and it's basically overgrown with, with some grass, but by not proceeding with paving it, it wouldn't really deter from the usage of the trailer. It would just make it more like a sidewalk if it was paved. Is that correct? It's not wheelchair accessible. Okay. Uh, you know, the, I think the one of the things that this community is known for, particularly after the rink grant uh, paving project, is the accessibility of the trails for people on skateboards, on rollerblades, on uh, and mobility devices. Um, you know, I think I just, I mean, we're, we're going to put this camera up on the, uh, the trail down to the Black Trink Bridge so that we can get an, under, an understanding of the usage of that trail. Uh, we've had it up in, in, the, in the winter, but now we want to put it up to see what's happening in the summer. I can tell you that I sat there one day, um, this was last summer, and talked to everybody that crossed the bridge. And you know, the usage, I think, will climb dramatically for all users, whether they be cyclists, whether they be people in wheelchairs and mobility devices, whether they be on skateboards, road bikes, whatever. Right now, this trail, as you state, is accessible for people on bicycles, it's accessible for people who are walking. And you know, I have to put in a plug for the city here because the city has done a great job in keeping the grass out. I just have one more comment. Go ahead. I've heard more comments this summer about the confusion and inaccessibility of the trail from downtown, like to access the trail from downtown here versus any other portion of the trail that's really confusing to go along the riverbank here and, and get onto the trail. So, and I'm wondering if that uh, is something that you guys are looking at. Some of you know, just people are, down our signs is a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's just if people are on the wheelchairs and they're on the accessible trails already, they kind of end up stopping over here. And there isn't a lot of access to even get 
So it goes down the alleyway behind uh, Home Hardware is where the trail goes. And uh, the problem is, as I say, people take down the signs for whatever reason. Councilor Dory. Oh, oh, Mr. Mayor, I was just wondering what a question on the uh, uh, on the timeline for the funding is. Is this is the ministry uh, allocating the money in 2013 and then it's gone, or is this a question of if council decides because if, if council decides to defer the decision, the paving time is over, coming to an end this year. So if we don't, uh, if they decide to pull it back, then is that do we, do we still have access to that money in 2014? I was kind of hoping you wouldn't ask that question because I can't give you a definitive answer. My guess at this moment uh, to the mayor, to your CEO, is that this money is targeted for this year. That's my guess. Can I ask what the paving time frame would be? What what, what closes that? Uh, well, it's the temperature. It's the temperature and the hauling distance for the asphalt. So if the asphalt is not uh, made here, the hauling distance and the temperature will will determine the quality of the asphalt. So we try not to pave too late into October. So really, the optimum paving time would be September. Uh, as we move later on to the fall, that the the integrity and the quality of the asphalt will deteriorate, and it will be less likely to to last a longer period of time. Be more susceptible to uh, problems cracking, moisture getting into it and stuff. When we do it in the warmer weather, it'll seal it. You'll see that you get a really nice taste seal. When it gets too, too cold, it gets almost like a little bit punky on the top, and then the snow melt and everything else will get into the actual structure. So, so you were hoping that this would happen for this year? Yes. Okay. Just to be clear. Councilor Jordy. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the Minister, the $50,000 has already been approved. Yes. Okay. So we're looking at 68,000. Yes. And, and the money is in uh, the slide, whatever. Uh, it, yeah, just to clarify, yeah. when the council had approved 200 and, I want to say 200, a little over $200,000 for, for a project to be, uh, that was going to be conducted as, as uh, towards the site pile. The surveys proved that, that that work didn't need to be done at this point. So that was already approved in the 2013 financial plan okay. in the capital budget. So that would form as a fall as part of the, this would fall as part of an additional portion of the capital budget. So you could take simply move that money from that account over to this account if you chose to. Yeah. So we wish I'll put a motion that we uh, bring that to tonight's meeting. Uh, Sixty-eight thousand for this. Okay. All right. We don't need a seconder for that motion. So the discussion is on the table. Uh, I, I understand it's a minimal savings to have our own aggregate used in the process, a little over $1,000. My understanding, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's around $7,000, is it? It's, it's around five for the total project, but the thousand is only our portion of the city loan plan. Okay, all right. So there is more savings, so, so up around 5000 for the whole project. For the whole project, yeah. yeah. Hi, Council. Uh, yes, thank you, Worship. Personally, uh, before I would vote in favor of approving any funding, I think we need to, to the answer to a couple of fundamental questions. And one is the ministry money, whether it has any, uh, whether that money is available, whether they match it or not. I'd like to know an answer to that question. And I'd also like to uh, hear from Area D and their contribution before I kind of obligate the city to take on a portion that they may be willing to pay for. So Yeah, there's that soft commitment there from Gary from D, which should be pursued for So the, the motion on the floor though is addressing the issue whether we bring this to, to the council tonight, a regular council meeting tonight, Councillor Doherty's motion. So on that matter of referring it to tonight's meeting. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Wires. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's where we're at this point. Uh, we've had the presentation, and it looks like there's uh, fifty thousand dollars we've allocated, sixty-eight that would be a new allocation. But as Councillor Authority sorted out here, it is basically slag fund money. And the two questions outstanding at this point by uh, Councillor Kendall are the issue of. Um, the participation of uh, Area D and the issue of whether or not this will roll over as a commitment from the ministry to 2014. Yeah, and we could have that in that motion tonight. 
Yeah, fairly. When we put it back on the table, I'm assuming we'll have a, a larger contingent of counselors tonight. Yes. So I'm going to support the motion just to bring it to tonight's meeting. Okay. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. What I will do in the interim is I will call John Hawkins. Short notice, I know, but we're trying because you got your bathing uh, deadlines here. I know, and uh, it's. <laughs> It seems to me, as uh, you know, your former CAO said, you know, nothing happens until the end of the summer, and then it's, it's crazy, yeah. right? Uh, particularly when we're dealing with ministry funding, and we run across this in pretty much every project that we dealt with. But I will call John Hawkins today, and I hopefully will have an answer uh, for your CAO this afternoon. And I will go and see Irene today, and I will try and test. Not Irene, not Irene, Willie Russell. Well, I, I, Willie's out of town, I think. Okay, and I would caution you to consult with John McLean before you talk to uh, the director who's off, uh, Irene. Okay, I will do that. Thank you very much for your guidance, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. You have the meeting today? I will be able okay. to get Good. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so from the audience participation standpoint, you get a zero. <laughs> we but were listening. It's early yet. <laughs> well, the <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are moving on to um, Sandra Barron from Mountain Media presenting uh, Advertising Billboards West, Colonia, and the Okanagan area. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. It's nice to see everybody again. I'm uh, wearing a bit of a different hat today. I'm not here representing Visitor's Choice. I'm here representing BC Billboards, which is a division of Mountain Media based out of um, Kelowna. And Mr. Allen asked that I come and address you today just to give you a bit of a background on um, some billboards that are available in the um, West Kelowna and the Okanagan area. And uh, just kind of present you with some information to see if it might be of interest for council to please, uh, uh, consider some advertising on billboards in the Okanagan. So, what do an airplane and a billboard have in common? I don't really have much of a punchline here for you. <laughs> the answer is a captive audience. I'm sure most of you have uh, been in an airplane and you're sitting um, you basically with nothing else to look at, and so you ultimately end up looking through the um, in-house magazines that they have. And that's why in-flight magazines charge such a high advertising rate. It's because basically you're a captive audience and what else do you have to look at? So billboards pretty much work um, in the same way. Uh, they reach a captive audience. So you can either look at the cars ahead of you as you're driving, or you can turn your head slightly and see your billboard advertising. As far as uh, traffic counts, um, there's just more and more traffic on the roads every day. And uh, commute times, especially in the Okanagan, are um, you know, doubling, tripling, and there's more and more traffic jams. So that captive audience just keeps on growing. Due to their size, billboards create a visual impact that's just not possible with any other type of media. By choosing a specific location, you can target your audience. You are controlling who sees your ad and where it is placed and no other advertising medium offers the same control. So what the city needs to do is determine who is your target audience. Are you looking to attract travelers that are heading our way? Are you looking to attract residents of the Okanagan that may be looking for some options to travel? By selecting billboard signs, you are choosing the most high impact, cost-effective method of advertising. Outdoor media reaches more people per ad dollar spent than any other media. And this is just a little bit of a comparison of what you can spend per week in the Okanagan and the type of uh, circulation or viewers that you would be attracting. So if you look at BC billboards, you can see for approximately $175 a week, you're attracting nearly half a million viewers in that one week period. So in Kelowna, $700 more or less a month will buy you a small ad in the local newspaper for a few days. But how many people will pick up that paper? 
how many of those will actually see or add amongst all the other photos and editorial. For that same $700 a month, or if we want to break it down, about $23 a day, a billboard in Kelowna reaches an average um, of 83,200 viewers. That is per day. That's just uh, around 2, around 2.5 million in just one month. Let's do the math. That's 330 million viewers per year. So it's pretty impressive. Now this is the great thing about billboards and why they're so effective. Because many of those viewers are repeat viewers commuting to and from work. This is an incredibly effective way to build your brand. It's a continuous public awareness campaign. So there's just a little no hustle, no bustle, settle down your brand for us. Whatever your brand is, whatever your message is, it's out there on a continuous basis. Putting the same message in front of the consumer creates impressions in the mind of the public, and that's what builds your brand awareness. Building your brand needs to be something that you do continually. You have spent a lot of heart, um, a lot of uh, time and hard work and money to build uh, the new Grand Forks brand. So now you need to get it out into uh, the faces of uh, your market. The goal is that your brand comes to mind to the consumer when they are ready for your type of product or service. So when they're ready to get away from Kelowna for the weekend and are trying to figure out where to go, then they remember seeing that billboard every day as they've been commuting and then they decide that they want to come and have a visit. The use of outdoor billboards is by far the best way to build your brand in terms of exposure to consumers. It reaches tens of thousands of consumers per day, every day, for a very low cost. That is why the top 50 um, Canadian companies in Canada all have outdoor advertising as their number one uh, media buy. So I just want to speak briefly about where uh, BC Billboards has its billboard locations. We uh, basically have five sites. Um, one in West, Col or actually two sites in West Kelowna, and you can see them there um, where we've got them identified. Um, they're both on Highway 97, um, in just outside of West Bank on your way heading into Kelowna, and then just before you actually hit the Kelowna Bridge as you go into downtown Kelowna. We also have one in the South Okanagan, um, just outside of Oliver. We also have sites in uh, Vernon, as well as Enderby, and then you may be familiar with the sites um, in the Boundary Country, which are just before you cross the bridge as you're heading to Rock Creek. So I just wanted to give you an idea of a sign that is available. Um, we do have approximately 45 signs uh, throughout the Okanagan, so um, we probably have an occupancy rate of about 85%. So we do currently have a few signs that are coming available, and this is just an example of one of them and what you'd be looking at. So most of our signs are 10 by 24 feet. This one's no exception. What we're looking at is the one that says Ski Big White there. That's the sign that's available. It's $675 per month based on a one-year contract. <coughs> So again, you have to consider in that one year, you're looking at about 30 million views. Um, if you did want to look at a two-year contract, then obviously your rate would be a little bit less. There is a one-time design, print, and production fee of um, $1,550. Should you produce your own camera-ready artwork, or should you have somebody like Story or company produce it for you, then um, there is a bit of a savings there for you. So. According to um, transportation and highways, this is how we get um, our information about the traffic. Um, in August of 2012, so this time last year, it was a daily viewer count of 83,681 uh, for this particular sign. So this is just a sample of another billboard that uh, the South Okanagan and Smith Queen Valleys um, produced. Uh, the whole idea is that you want to keep it as simple as possible. And so this just gives you an idea of you know, something along the lines of what you could do for the Grand Forks area. Um, I just want to speak briefly, kind of in conclusion here, about uh, creating an effective billboard. Um, because we can put you in front of the viewers, we can provide you with um, 
the opportunity to be seen, but it really then depends on what you put on your billboard as to how effective it's going to be. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of clients go out and spend the money, even hire, you know, fancy production teams, and they get so much information on it that it just basically is a wash as you drive by. You have to consider that you, you know, you've only got a short um, amount of time to make a good impression. So the key is to make your message simple. And I would refer that you go back to the branding that's been done. You take some of those key elements, you figure out who your um, market is. Like I say, is it people that are living in the Okanagan that you want to come and have spend a weekend here? Are you trying to connect to the traveling public to reroute them to come on to Highway 3? Um, you really sort of have to take some time. And that is something that I can work with uh, your staff should you decide that you want to do a billboard. And I would really encourage you to look at finding one key image that you think sort of represents the community of Grand Forks and the message that you want to um, have people remember. Use as few words as possible. Remember, you've got a very short time in which to capture their attention. Um, in addition to a web address or a phone number, use text to make your name or brand dominant. So that would be you know, your theme of settle down or um, peaceful living. Uh, try to convey the rest of the message through your photo and image. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, with billboards, that is uh, your entire key, is, is your images that you use. And use professional artwork and images. And again, that's something that we can certainly help you with. And be consistent with your branding. Like I say, the whole key, now that you have a brand, is to be consistent and get it out there in um, an exposure. Questions? Uh, you're suggesting a yearly or two-year contract. Is, there, is, that, is that the only two options? No, nope, nope. the longer the term, uh, the better your <coughs> So if you want to secure that billboard in that place, we have a lot of people who sign five-year leases with us. How much does that reduce the kind of saving percent wise does that represent? You're probably about a hundred dollars um, a month saving <coughs> per year that you commit to. So if we went back it was six seventy five um, for a one year commitment, five seventy five that would probably go down. A lot of it too depends on the location. Um, obviously some of our locations are very high demand and we have um, you know, um, no problem with filling them. So we're reluctant to reduce the weight down too much because we know that eventually they will sell. Um, and just because I'm not familiar with billboards, but the artwork, is it something that, and I'm just throwing some stuff out here, if we chose three months now and three months later, is it, is it $1,500 each time. time, each time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's to print the actual vinyl. Um, and all of our billboards are, um, uh, we get print on vinyl, which makes them um, very weather resistant. They're all UV protected. So they have um, a lifespan of three years. So you could very well um, have one billboard and if you only paid up 1550 once for that whole three year term. We also have some people who choose to have seasonal information. So you would print up your billboards at that time, but there would be an installation charge, you know, like seven hundred dollars or so to actually go swap out your billboards or the information that you want in there. Um, I would encourage you just to come up with one um, like one image or maybe two images at the most that would keep you, you know, bridge it for your seasons. And then you would just have that one time cost and then you would just be doing your event. Motion to accept the report for the yeah, discussion on the other And further questions before we leave this? Mr. Mathis, yeah. for clarification, this would be something that we would talk with uh, council about in the budgeting process. Just wanted to make sure that we had this on the table so as we move forward into the uh, uh, October, as we move forward into the budgeting process, that we could talk about the developments in council one. Mm -hmm. So council will see this information again in October if they want. Great. Yeah, and then, you know, should you decide to do anything, I would work with the staff and we can determine what's available at that time, what the best location would be, what kind of marketing message we want to put forward with. Okay. Oh, just a moment, we have a question. 
Yeah, well, um, I'm actually really sold on billboards after hearing this, but I'm just wondering if council has any research telling them if we draw a lot from the Okanagan coming back this way, or whether those dollars would be better spent on billboards in Spokane and Calgary that's coming out the other direction. Good question. Um, I don't know whether we have that um, demographic data. The the, uh, the billboard company, when I talked to uh, Senator's uh, partner, uh, so uh, he, he said there was some there was some statistical numbers on there. We would talk to the tourism uh, people as well to see whether the, the top open on dollars would be expensive where the the uh, where it's best to advertise. That would be part of the options of Senator for them to say based on this information. Okay. Okay, so it will be part of the consideration of council, isn't it? No, I just know from a real estate point of view that Grand Forks is seeing a lot of spillover from the Okanagan. Yeah. Because as people move to Kelowna looking for a smaller fair community, you realize that the hustle and bustle is, is not at all what they might have expected. So just we're, a, we're definitely getting spillover. Yeah. Just a, a little story to speak to that. I was speaking with um, Bree and Cheryl at Pistol Pot Gifts, and they were saying that there was a couple that came in and just decided to go for a drive and ended up in Grand Forks. Absolutely loved it, dropped $500 in their store and said, you know, we're going to come back. This is a great little weekend getaway. And I really think there's a huge market for that just to encourage people to just, like you say, come for a weekend. Once they're here, then you know, maybe they'll stay a little bit longer. Yeah. As a business owner here in town, uh, approximately 50% of my business comes from Alberta. Right. So you're you're in favor of trying to, to reach that audience yes. as well. Yeah, and there is. Um, we could probably get you in touch with some uh, billboard companies that might have some signage coming from those ways as well. You have so nothing in the uh, no, we're primarily for that area. No, we're primarily based um, in the Okanagan. But, but certainly, if that's what council decides they want to do, I'm sure we can help set that as well. I could be wrong, but doesn't Alberta have some kind of bylaw against billboards? In, well, I think just to let you know, yeah, I think, yeah, I think on the native reserves is the only spot where well, that's how it, are. yeah, that's how it works in BC. Um, Grand Forks seems to be um, an exception to this rule, and I'm not quite sure why you have to ask the Ministry of Highways, but um, municipalities dictate what can signage can be done within their community, and then once you get outside of the municipality then it's under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Transportation and Highways. And they, um, you can ask and get a permit from them, like our highway information size, you know, we, we have uh, acceptance from them. But they won't allow just an average business person to just put up a sign on the side of the road. Um, the exception to that is uh, reservation land. And so all of our signs are on reservation land. And that's why you always see um, billboards and pockets when you see five or six of them in a row, it's because you know, they're paying least to the, the, uh, the investigation. So I don't, I can't speak to Alberta, but I would guess it probably works in the same sort of way. Okay. That's it. Okay. All those in favor? No, it's just too expensive. Okay, and the, uh, the next item of business, we are going to break at uh, approximately 10 o'clock, so um, Jan Westland, um, do you think there's enough time here? Or um, you, oh. 10 minutes. I don't know what time it is. It's, it's 10 minutes. quarter to oh, okay. 10 okay. minutes. And then we'll break after your presentation. Good morning. I've been speaking with the summer cold, so I'm going to do my best. And I brought back up Sheila Kobe, so we'll see how <laughs> Over the past several months, our organization and other individuals have been talking to citizens and offering them opportunity to sign a petition requesting that council pass a non-binding resolution to make Grand Forks a genetically engineered free zone. <clears throat> Over 500 people from Grand Forks and the surrounding area have signed their names to this request of council, which states, I support the creation of a GE free zone in Grand Forks, BC. I object strongly to the release into the environment of genetically engineered, modified organisms until the long-term consequences of such products 
and organisms are fully understood or have been sufficiently shown to have no deleterious environmental, economic, and health effects. This is a simple statement signed by locals who believe that the corporate push to develop this type of technology is profit-driven, of course. It offers no benefit to them as consumers, while posing a substantial threat to agriculture as we've depended on it through time. This initiative is part of a province-wide grassroots movement called GE Free BC. So far, Powell River, Salt Spring Island, Denman Island, Nelson, Caslow, New Denver, Rossland, Richmond, Saanich, Batochin, Telquah, City of North Vancouver have passed individual resolutions declaring themselves GE free zones. At the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities meeting in April this year, an additional 51 other municipalities sent a message expressing strong concern about GE crops and animals. For a quick background, four genetically engineered crops are grown in Canada. <coughs> Excuse me. Corn, canola, soy, and white sugar beet. About 45% of corn and 85% of soybeans in North America is genetically engineered, while 75% of processed foods in the stores could have some of these ingredients. The federal government has recently licensed GE alfalfa for use in the East, and GE apples are under development here in BC, and this is where the real problem is for us. You may be aware that the UBCM has endorsed four resolutions expressing concern about genetically engineered crops as follows. In 99, they asked for the halt uh, to halt the growing monopolization of our food production industry through Terminator technology and other patents. In 2006 and again in 2009, they requested that the federal government label GE organisms. In 2012, they asked the BC government to declare BC a GE-free province in respect to tree fruits. This fall, there will be a motion on the floor to make G BC a GE-free zone in its entirety. <clears throat> there are sizable concerns regarding the incursion of GE crops into our agriculture areas and food supply. Perceived threats include contamination of non-GE crops by pollen from genetically modified organisms, safety concerns, and corporate control. As far as contamination is concerned, some species such as canola cross-pollinate more easily than others. If you're next to a farm growing GE canola, it's impossible to grow non-GE canola. That's why conventional and organic crops, canola crops, in the prairies have been wiped out completely. The results of introducing GE alfalfa and GE apples could be the same here. It could lead to significant economic loss for organic farmers who use alfalfa as a rotational crop. Grand Forks has both an organic dairy and orchard industry that will be threatened by the incursion of these crops into our valley. Citizens, farmers, and local governments must halt its use in these communities. There are safety questions because GE crops are not an extension of traditional breeding methods or hybridization. They are created by inserting new gene sequences into organisms, often from unrelated species. The basic assumption of the science is questionable. We're learning that it's impossible to insert new genes into an organism with predictable, continuous results. GE crops have not been demonstrated to be safe. The standard for judgment by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Health Canada are lax. When the CFIA reviews an application for novel food, its evidence comes from the corporation making the application, and this data is kept secret. There is no independent testing of GE crops or animals in Canada. Until we know for sure they are safe, the citizens of this community are saying GE crops shouldn't be allowed. We want to see the precautionary principle put in place. Finally, corporate control is a big concern. The interests of large corporations and local citizens do not overlap. Multinationals are interested in large-scale farming and monocropping for maximum profit. profit. Here we are interested in the health of our community, our food security, and supporting our small-scale farmers. GE, crop, GE crops are about making profits for companies, often large multinationals. Six agriculture biotech corporations now control most of the technology needed to develop GM crops, as well as the agrochemicals, crop germplasm, and seeds. GE seeds are patented, which allows companies to take control over living organisms. The same corporations which are developing and controlling genetically engineered seeds are buying up and controlling traditional open pollinated seeds as well. 
In Canada, they are seeking the right to discontinue selling the latter seed mines as they see fit. The Council has already taken a leadership role on this issue by adopting a food charter which includes the statement that it will advocate for the protection of local producers and agricultural lands by opposing the introduction of genetically engineered crops which threaten the genetic purity of seeds and the economic value of the existing local organic industry while exposing farmers to legal challenges. This petition shows great public support for your vision. We would like to present the Mayor and Council with our collected signatures and ask that they move forward to pass this resolution in accordance with the wishes of hundreds of local citizens who give GE crops See, who view GE crops as a very real threat to our local food security. Can I hold you for a second there, uh, Mr. Allen? Just a point of clarification. Our council supported the Agricultural Society's food charter. Our yes. council did not adopt the food charter. Just a point of clarification. It's a very strong point of clarification from a legal perspective. Do <clears throat> yeah. you support our food charter, which has this statement in it? Yes, we supported that, but we just, we, the, the statement was the council had adopted a food charter. Mm -hmm. But we didn't actually adopt it. We supported the agriculture society. Okay, you supported the statement. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, I should point out at this point that this this whole entire resolution, which we are asking you to adopt, is non-binding. It doesn't have again legal ramifications because this isn't really your purview or your area of concern, except to support your citizens in expressing what they want in the ballot, what they would like to see. So we would like to present the Mayor and Council with our collected signatures and ask that you move forward to pass this resolution in accordance with the wishes of hundreds of local citizens who view GE crops as a very real threat to our local food security. We also ask that you take direction from our response and vote for the motion to make BC GE free at the Union of BC Municipalities next month. Thank you. Um, just to maybe to kick it off on the issue of non-binding, is that practically then if someone introduces a G crop here we wouldn't be expected to attempt to control that or uh, specifically use I, our powers to deal with it i don't really know what powers you would be able to bring um i think what we're talking about here is a show of support by so our philosophical in principle support yeah. Oh, well, because you have very little, you have no control over what's growing in the area really. in any way. And uh, as I research this, I find that we actually have no way of knowing what genetically engineered crops are already being grown here. There could be some silage corn. I know there's organic um, soy crops in a pilot that would be under siege if you know genetically engineered soy was here. Uh, there, uh, there's no listing. We can't go. And farmers who are using GE. Uh, are not asked to register anywhere. So uh, this is proactive, although the, the horse has been out of the fence for a while on this one, but at least it shows in this community, we don't, people do not want to see a proliferation of GE crops. We like agriculture the way it's done. We like extension developments, the ag extension developments that improved seed, but we want uh, to have organic, open pollinated seed usage for all time. We want to protect our seeds. We want to protect our agriculture. And that's what this would show. Okay. Opening discussions, council or gallery? Councilor Kendall. Um, have you approached, again, the city as very limited mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, farmland or control over any farmland? And I understand what you're asking. You're asking us to kind of support you in principle, which I don't have a problem with, but I, uh, have you approached the regional districts? No, we have or, not. No. Uh, that they would seem, or the regional district in general, who uh. would be regional district, I think, would, uh, you know, would, would probably be a... Uh, um, what, what I'm really hopeful is going to happen here is that you can pass this resolution and we can add your name to the other 62 communities who have supported it. I think we should be there, and this is in the heart of agriculture country, and it would be meaningful to show that people here uh, have a sense that, that they've got something good that we want to be able to hold on to. So, um, again, this is going to the Union of BC Municipalities in the fall. And, and we're hopeful that you'll be able to, whoever is representing this council, will be able to vote for the motion on the floor. 
and um, if further work is required, we'll do it. We're certainly, as the Ag Society, prepared to continue along this way because it's important to us. But, but no, we didn't approach the regional district, mostly knowing that um, you know, the population base is here. Okay, thank you. Motion to accept the report, Councilor Doherty. Um, we're accepting the report for further discussion. Uh, the other option is to refer it to our council meeting tonight. You can accept it and refer it to tonight's yeah, council meeting, good, yeah. if that's your desire. Yes, please. Okay, so that's the vote that we're going to take. Uh, so it could be approved formally tonight, uh, should council desire to do that. Councillor Smith. I'm just I'm just wondering, like, if this is already a motion that's going to be put before the UBCM for decision there. What, what really is the point of making a decision on it here? Because well, I mean, we as individual counselors uh, in attendance at the UBCM, four of us will be there and we'll each have a vote on whether or not to support the UBCM motion. I'm just wondering if it's really kind of redundant. I could speak to that. Okay. Sheila? Um, I think, uh, first of all, I want to um, speak to Councillor Kendall's comment about the regional district. Um, we have intentions of continuing this conversation. It will go regionally. It has to. And uh, we'll, we will go municipality by municipality if we have to as well. But it will be a wider conversation. Um, for uh, for Gary, uh, sorry, um, Gary Smith's, uh, <laughs> sorry, Councillor Smith's <laughs> comment, I think it's really essential that the, the council make a collaborative stand on this and, and discuss together so that you individually at this meeting at the UBCM have the confidence of your council behind you and your vote and that this is something that you collectively understand and agree to. It, this, is, this is a value. This is, a, this is an important consideration for the future of agriculture in our valley. And if you make this kind of collective understanding then you have to show that solid, solid value statement about this issue. And that, I think, really, I, what I believe is the reason it's not redundant, it's essential. It's an essential statement of principle. And Councillor Smith, did you, what's up? Did you, is that satisfying? <laughs> uh, well, no, not necessarily, because again, um, you know, the regional is targeting the area he has not been again not been uh, consulted first and that's where all the agriculture is being grown so if the impact of a decision by the very indeed you know is sought because there are four thousand people out there as well as right. a larger population of yeah. because our community has actually the, the list of people who signed the petition is very interesting um many of the local farmers are on this list if you, you might want to go through it and, and see okay. who's present but I, I would love to point out that what we would like to see is a sign talking about sign uh, approach in the city that says we're a gene free zone. When we claim that for ourselves, so people know our attitude, our approach to agriculture, our sense about food security and the values that we stand for, it will be listed. And the other, the other part that comes to my mind is this will be a weighted discussion, I think, at the meeting this fall at the convention because there are large um, areas in the Fraser Valley, but there are places in the province which have already adopted GE, and once you go down that path, there's there's hardly any opportunity to return. We're talking about protecting what we have here, which we know is very good compared to anywhere in the country, and so. Uh, you know, you, you, you want to take care of us, and then you want to go and, and fight a bigger fight in the convention. Yeah. Councilor Wires. Thank you, Jim. Uh, can you tell me why GMOs were introduced in our food chain? Well, um, I would say Monsanto, although the other large companies were part of it as well. It, it's it's technological advancement that probably grew out of the the ability of agriculture extension departments to fine tune hybridization and well, breeding techniques. It's and molecular bio biology that, that they're designing new Absolutely. It, it's of technology food. which is just built on one thing advanced to another and got and the profit the profit to be made is immense and Monsanto is a is a huge and very powerful company. It's the same with 
how they brought back uh, Agent Orange from the Vietnam War and turned it into Roundup and started using it, convincing us that we needed to use it for other purposes. So you it's don't see this as a step to feed our world population that has reached no. 7 billion? No, no. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who say that's not going to be happening using these techniques because uh, the, the Roundup insertion, Roundup insertion into uh, corn and soy has proven that what that allows them to do is use far more chemicals than they might normally have done, resulting in more residue on these crops, but also uh, insects that are now resistant. So there's a, the, the downside is catching up to this, this big new te technology that's being forced down people's throats, farmers' throats for the most part. They're not begging for well, they're regulated. Stuff. My brother-in-law is a farmer. Mm -hmm. If you don't have your spray order in, you don't get your bank. Yes, overdrive. so it's kind of, it's, they've got a grip on agriculture is what it's beginning to look like. And uh, for a community like ours, which is small, which has small producers, has uh, an organic industry, has good land, has, has everything about being able to keep agriculture as we've known it for a long time. We can take care of ourselves here. Um, I'm not convinced in the studies that will say that you know the, the G crops are not the answer. They well, I'm not convinced we can I'm not convinced we can take care of ourselves here oh. with the land mass we have. George Penfold identified that we couldn't in an agricultural study about three years ago. What did he, uh, I haven't said, read I could, I could send you that study. I'd like to see it, but what did he say we were missing? So oil, we so don't have the land mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, Which we have a couple of questions from the, the back. The I just want to Great. Sure. Well, I don't think G is the answer by any stretch, and there are uh, studies saying that now, too. Okay. Well, is it all right to make a comment? Yeah, two, two people there. Is it all right to make a comment rather yeah. than a question? Um, about genetic en engineering, I understand that humans are still learning, like there's the genome project, and we're still learning about genes, okay? Genetics, and um, GM organisms are about experimenting and seeing, you know, what we could do with the food. But we are now producing genetic organ genetically modified products that are being fed to animals or people. Now, it looks like regular food, but it isn't something that happens in nature normally. So we've changed it. Now what happens, say it looks like food, and say the creatures eat it, and then we eat, eat it. What are the changes? We, we, it's a bit of an experiment, actually. Um, we don't actually know. It's not something that's naturally occurring. And the thing is that you create these, and you put them out in the environment, and then nature spreads it around. The bees spread it around through pollination. So we don't really know the consequences of things, but we see changes in animals like bats that have mold on them. How did that happen? What did they eat? Is it connected to genetic modification? So it could affect species. So it's a bit of an experiment. Um, it isn't natural, and we don't fully know everything about genetics yet. So. Um, we know nature works. In this area, we have, um, when, when you look at land quality, Grand Forks does have some of the rarest soil that's really good soil for growing many things, which is like 0.5% of Canadian soil. Um, and in Ontario, they built over a lot of it. So we, we are sitting on very good soil that isn't totally utilized to feed the people here. We're still importing a lot. But but the decisions we make here really are important and it's really worth considering. And the changes to our environment and safety and food security, we have responsibility for ourselves here, but what we do here also impacts even Canada, like larger out there. So please please consider this, you know, Thank this you. very carefully. And Probably the last comment. Okay. Uh, Council, it is very important that we go off GMOs. The main reason GMOs were created was so that they could in, uh, apply more and more Roundup to the crops without the crops dying. Applying more and more Roundup to the crops has given the food more chemicals in it that we're consuming and is killing the soil and if it kills the soil it kills the earthworm and i'm sorry i may be into earthworms 
But if we lose our earthworms, it's like losing the bumblebee, the honeybee. That's the worm lady. She knows. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just wanted to say my word here for one. Yeah, <laughs> quickly, we'll, we're going to break for. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, aside from the whether it's uh, Franken Foods or any particular company like Monsanto, because Monsanto's not the only company, they didn't invent this. <laughs> From a, and we're not big exporters of grain, like some parts of Canada might be in the States, but from a geopolitical point of view, there are countries and whole blocks of countries which don't like GMOs, in Japan, for instance. And recently, it was shown that some of the test crops from 2004 that were seeded just in Washington State, I believe, or Oregon, actually had escaped into other crops. And traces of those crops had been found in grain that would end up being exported to Japan. And the moment that news item came out, Japan embargoed U.S. grain imports. So from that point, if we ever wanted to get to the point where I think most of the stuff grown in this valley is actually decorative trees and plants and not food crops. But if we ever wanted to get to the point of being a seed generator for the world like we were during the Second World War or something like that, the fact that there might be GMO contamination may limit our ability to market ourselves around the world to other geopolitical blocks that don't like it. I just wanted to point Excellent point. Yeah. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to uh, recommend this to council this evening. All those in favor? Uh, excuse me, would you like me to attend and speak to you to more? Um, I think you've probably covered most of council. If you can leave us your petition, and uh, uh, you're welcome to attend this evening to, uh, to the meeting as well. Um, we, we don't have a delegation on the matter, and so you would have an opportunity at the end of the meeting to speak to it, but not during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, council, we're going to break for uh, 12 minutes. You all get very well. <laughs> and there you go, that's the end of part one of the council meeting. And uh, in 10 minutes, we'll be back in part two. Oh, no.